Hi everybody, this is Kat Ng from Barrett Kohler Publishers in Oakland. If you hear a little echo, don't adjust your audio. Um, that is me. <laughs> we just moved into a brand new office and we're still working on the soundproofing, so I apologize in advance. Um, but I wanted to let everybody know that uh, about a few quick things on the GoToWebinar control panel in case you're not familiar. Um, we are doing an Ask Me Anything session today, which means that you can type in a question for our guest at any time. Um, and you would do that by uh, going to the chat box at the bottom and typing in um, your question there. I will ask the questions live. You'll hear your question asked and you'll also hear it answered live. So let's get started. Alexander Watkins, thank you for joining us. Hello. Hi. Alexander. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had to unplug my phone so it wouldn't ring during this and I ran away. Was I, supposed to? <laughs> I wasn't sure where you were. Ah, we hear you now. So you're here. So I just went over the quick um, sort of housekeeping things about how people can participate by typing in their questions into the chat box and I will ask them live. So, um, but I first wanted to give you a chance to introduce yourself and um, welcome everybody to the webinar. Okay. So hi everyone. I'm Alexander Watkins author of Hello, My Name is Awesome, How to Create Brand Names at Stick. And uh, I, th I think you guys know about me, probably. I founded a naming firm called Eat My Words. Uh, we started out uh, specializing in naming things that make people fat and drunk, which is why we're called Eat My Words. And now we name everything. And uh, I'm just happy to be here and ready for your questions. So, uh, you know, bring it on. Okay. And so... Uh, we have our first question here, and the question is, Alexandra, um, I've hit a roadblock when it comes to creating a name that isn't, that is both provocative and rated G. Um, what's your advice on this? Oh, that's an interesting question. Well, I would say provocative and rated G probably don't, don't ever happen. You got to pick one over the other. I would say provocative provocative and rated PG-17, maybe. <laughs> so it, it all depends on where your name will be seen. For instance, we named a frozen yogurt franchise Spoon Me. So Spoon Me started in Utah, in Salt Lake City. And Spoon Me is not a rated G name. And even though Utah is kind of a rated G place, uh, the, name, the name worked. It was popular with teenagers. And actually, the the older Mormon couples that we thought we might offend, and we didn't want to, they actually found the name really endearing because, you know, spooning is pretty innocent, but, you know, remember, spooning leads to forking, so you got to be careful. But that, that name actually worked, but I would never say that was a provocative name that was rated G. We named a nail salon in the Castro, which is San Francisco's, I don't want to say it's our gay neighborhood, every neighborhood here is, is very happily gay, but it's probably our, it's our iconic gay neighborhood, and we named it Handjob. That name is obviously not rated G, but it, it works there. But as far as provocative, yeah, you're never going to get a rated G provocative name. I would just say make sure that you're not offending your core audience, and uh, any name that I'll, I'll give you an example of a name, Hot Mama is the name or was the name of a chain of, of clothing stores that the target audience was moms that were too old to shop at Forever 21 but still wanted to look good. And they had to change their name because some malls were so conservative that they did not want a store called Hot Mama in the mall. So they changed their name to something really, really terrible. It's Ever Eve, E V E R E V E, which which is really if you spell it out on a piece of paper, it doesn't look like it's pronounced Ever Eve. It's just a weird name. Yeah, it's so, awkward. Uh, yeah, it's awkward. But you know, it's too bad because Hot Mama is a great name. But when they when they weren't able to get into some malls, uh, they had to change it, which is too bad. So that's why you know know your audience, so you don't have to go through a name change. Absolutely. Okay, so the next question is, what is the hardest product or company you have ever named, and what made it difficult? 
That's a good question. Uh, that's a great question, and I definitely have the answer to that. It was a printing company. Now, here's what's going on. The printing company, they, they printed things, but they offered all kinds of creative services. Anytime you offer creative services, whether it's naming, branding, web design, social media, PR, direct mail, anything related to creative services is really hard to name. And these, the printing company offered some of these things because those type of businesses, ad agencies, for instance, are very creative and they come up with creative names. So all of the creative names we came up with were taken. And I can't tell you the, the one that we, we recommended to the client and they chose and they trademarked, they ended up not using and I've never used it. Uh, I haven't used it again to name something, but I have it in my back pocket, so I can't tell you what it is. But those type of names, naming a social media company, anything related to you know a design firm, super, super hard to do. Uh, with, we have done it successfully and obviously Eat My Words falls into that category, but that that was the most excruciating project I've ever worked on and I think we got paid $20,000 for that and I would honestly give all the money back just not to have that experience. It was, it was horrible. Ouch, that does not sound fun. You know, one of the things that this brings to mind for me is the question of um, from the perspective of somebody who was actually going to be a client of a naming firm like Eat My Words, um, what are, what's some practical advice you have for somebody who's never hired a firm before? That's a great question. My best advice is look at their portfolio and at, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter all the smoke and mirrors and jargon talk and everything and impressive things on their website. That's all good. But at the end of the day, all you're going to get is a name. That's really just what happens. So look at the names in their portfolio. And even if you recognize some of the names, like Rosarium, like, oh, I know that name. They must be really good. Rosarium isn't, I don't even know what Rosarium is. I just know somebody got paid to name that. That, just because you recognize it doesn't mean it's a good name. So look at the names in the, in the portfolio and ask yourself, you know, is this name easy to spell and pronounce and remember? Do I know what it would I know what it meant if I hadn't seen an ad for it on TV? And also ask the naming firm or the firm that you're considering hiring who comes up with the names because oftentimes we get hired by other naming and branding firms to do their work for them. A lot of branding firms offer naming as a service but don't keep namers on staff. So they outsource their work to us. Uh, that's how I got you know, and that's what I used to do is work for, uh, that's how I got started is freelancing for a lot of these firms. And now we still work with a number of them, but we, we tell them like, hey, we want to share credit for coming up with this since we're actually doing it. But, uh, and I, the question I always tell people to ask is, if the agency was a book, would you want to read it? Hmm. That's, a good, so, that's a good point. That's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, really. So make sure that you have a personality connection with people. Yeah. It, or if it's a date, would you want to go on it? <laughs> right. Exactly. And, and another thing, too, is it, while it seems helpful to contribute your own name ideas to a naming firm, and you can certainly do it before the project starts, just after you kick off the project, just go back to your day job, do what you do best, and let the naming firm do what they do best. And uh, don't even worry about it. That's We're here to take the stress off your plate and to serve you and have you not even think or worry about the name. Just let us do our job. So, Because oftentimes a, a client still wants to play and be involved, and it's, it's not really helpful to us, unfortunately. That sounds like pretty practical advice for working with any creative firm or yeah. freelancer. <laughs> I think you're right. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. The graphic designers, especially, I I feel I feel their pain. Uh, they have it much worse than than me. I mean, we're just coming up with words, and 
they're dealing with clients that want to that have bought Adobe Creative Suite for two thousand dollars and suddenly want to contribute, you know, font ideas and colors and you know tweak things and just let let the creative firm do what you hired them to do. That's what you're paying them for. I think that's practical advice. So this next question says, and this is a good one too. I would love to get your input and guidance on how to write a tagline. We use this. Do we use the same principles um, that you use for coming up with a name or what do we focus on? I've come up with a name I like that's catchy, but I don't know how to follow it up with a more clear descriptive tagline. That's a good question. And you'll notice there is no chapter on taglines in my book because it's, 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 I think it's harder to learn how to write a tagline than to come up with a name, but I'll give you some tips from, from what I know. Okay, the first thing is, you want your tagline to tie into your name. So I would say, I'll give you an example of one that we did. It was for a realty company called Red Oak Realty. So a way to come up with a tagline for someone like them is ideate or come up with ideas around the concept of what the business is or what the name is. So their Red Oak is not something we named, but a realtor, what's a realtor involved in? You know, buying and selling homes, moving in, moving out. The tagline we came up with was nice move, which work for buyers and sellers. So it didn't have realty in the tagline. You should never have your name in the tagline. And if you want a descriptive tagline, try to at least make it clever and not so descriptive that it's just like, you know, the number one realtor in the East Bay. Uh, you want to do something more creative. Some taglines that I love, cotton, the fabric of our lives. Uh, Nike's tagline, just do it, obviously a favorite. That's a battle cry, tag, battle cry tagline. One that I really liked is uh, for Alaska Seafood, which uh, they wanted to say that it was wild and sustainable, and sustainable is just such a mouthful, clunky, horsey name, word. So uh, we did... Um, it was Alaska salmon naturally abundant, which says wild and sustainable, but it just says it in a prettier way. So look for things that are related to what the business does or related to the name and, and try to tie it into that. So I'd say what you could do is just go to, so let's say you named your company um, Helium. Look up the word helium, go to a thesaurus. Yeah, I guess you could use some things in the book. Go to a thesaurus, go to a dictionary, and look up that word, helium, and see what are some things related to that word. So whatever your name is, like Eat My Words, our tagline is, um, we've had many taglines. The great thing about a tagline, you can change it all the time. We've had When You're Starved for Fresh Ideas, Magnetic Names That Stick, which is tied into our logo of the little fridge poetry magnets. So yeah, go uh, go to Dictionary and Thesaurus, I think would be really helpful for a tagline. Great. So this next question is, launching an online retail business, luxury stylish tableware and fine gourmet foods. Actually, that sounds pretty good. Um, I'm looking forward to this site. And it says, thoughts on using pseudonames for a retail business to build the brand story as a personality. For example, Ted Baker. I'm not a fan of, okay, is Ted Baker not? A real name is Ted Baker not a real person? When you said pseudonames, I'm not sure. I, you know, that I, was way, news I to me. I have a beautiful Ted Baker dress. <laughs> yeah, I have a gorgeous Ted Baker dress, and I thought Ted was the guy that designed it, but maybe not. Here's my feeling about made-up names. I would not do them for a couple reasons. One, even if it is a real person, let's say, like, um, you know. Uh, Versace, right? It, it takes years to build a brand like that and for brand recognition. It will never happen overnight with a made-up name or even a real name. Made-up names are the only time I think that they're acceptable is when it clearly is not a real person. For instance, Tommy Bahamas. You know there is no Tommy Bahama. That's just a cool, fun, made-up name. Sure. Johnny Rockets. There's no Johnny Rocket, right? Right. Um, we worked on 
coming up with a name for a restaurant chain in Canada that's called Joey's. There is no Joey. And every time someone would call the PR firm and ask, you know, we want to interview Joey, or there was no Joey to interview. Um, and the name that we came up with to rename them, they were famous for Bellinis. Everybody would order pictures of Bellinis there. So the name that I really liked was Joey Bellinis because you would know that, okay, that's not a real person. Another made-up name that I think got into some trouble was there was a great brand maybe 10 years ago called Cocktails by Jen. And you, it was a, a little kind of carrying case of four little mini bottles of margaritas or different different uh, spirits, and when you opened it up, it was, you know, hi, my name's Jen, and I came up with this company because I used to have my friends over to watch Sex in the City. Well, there was no Jen. It was all made up. The company was started by two guys, and people would call the PR firm and want to talk to Jen, and there was no Jen. So you, as a pseudoname, are not authentic, and I think today in the world of transparency that we live in, it, you're just not going to get away with that. So I would say don't make up a pseudoname. Come up with a cool name. It sounds like maybe something with table in it. That, that could be something that works. That's a good point. Well, and we've seen that recently with Facebook trying to switch to, it's controversial, but trying to get users to switch to real names. Um, so that could be another argument for doing that more than ever. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Like there is no Betty Crocker, right? That's true. But, but, you know, that brand is so old. I think back in the day, I mean, who knew that there was no internet to, to see who Betty, there was no, you know, Betty Crocker wasn't tweeting or ha didn't have a Facebook page. So yeah, I'd be really, really careful with that. Do That's a name. And do a name that says something about your brand. Ted Baker doesn't say anything that it's a designer. You would never know. Where a name like Juicy Couture, ooh, that, that has a lot of visual imagery, and it really has a personality and says something. It at least indicates that it's clothing, right? Yeah, you have a very good point. So this next question is, um, if they said, first off, thanks for doing this, so I'll give you that props first. <laughs> <laughs> I found that one of the most challenging aspects of finding a name is finding one that is available or ownable. What's your advice on finding a name that will successfully overcome the trademark hurdles? Ooh, this is a good one. Okay. You have to be unexpected. So... In financial services, for instance, or car insurance, all of those names that, you know, uh, Apex, uh, you know, I'm just trying to think of some, uh, I'm just blanking on, oh, Catalyst, you know, those type of names are all going to be taken. Um, look, either make up a word that sounds like a real word. Two of my favorites are Pentium and Groupon. Right, and those sound like real words, and you know what you they are just you know how to spell them when you hear them, which is key when coining a word. Or just go completely out of the box. I think metaphorical names work really well. Uh, I mean, look at Amazon. That's a great metaphorical name that didn't say anything. You know, if they had called themselves Book Barn, for instance, that uh, you might have been able to trademark it, but it was you know they could not be who they are today if they had called themselves Book Barn. I think if you use phrases also, like eat my words is a phrase, right? Uh, we named a copy company uh, or copy brand, I have a bean, like I have a dream, they're a socially responsible coffee company. That was just a play on, on I have a dream. So try a phrase, we, we named a commercial cleaning company, a janitorial service, eat my dust. Another phrase, phrases are good because they're familiar and they're easy to remember and oftentimes the domains are available and you don't have to have the exact domain name, but you'd be surprised what you can find that is a phrase. And I'll tell you, one of, one of my favorite names is really long, but it's super memorable and this is, this is an, a name that could get trademarked because it was so unexpected. 
it's a furniture consignment store. They're in San Francisco. It's online, actually. And it's called Previously Owned by a Gay Man. Great name. Super <laughs> memorable. You know, long, but that's okay. They, they have the domain. It's hard to forget. And it's really, it, you know, it instantly says, okay, this is really fine, cool quality furnishings. I love that. I'm going to have to go look that up after this. Um, <laughs> it sounds good. I bet there's some really good furniture. <laughs> okay, so the next question is, other than pricing, what do you see as pros and cons of hiring a large agency like Interbrand versus a smaller one like yours? Ooh, this could be some face-off here. Hmm. Okay, so, I've, and you know, full disclosure, Interbrand has hired Eat My Words to come up with names for them. So, one thing is, when you work with a big company like that, you're not going to work with the founder. Your a team will get assigned to your project, and I worked I've worked at enough ad agencies to know that when your when your plate is a little open, you just get tossed an assignment. It doesn't matter if you're if you have any interest in working on it, if you're in the target audience, and you're just the team assigned. So you're going to not work with the agency principal. They might not even be alive anymore. Like, you know, Walter Landor, rest in peace. I mean, he's like the father of the naming industry. And But you work with Landor, you're not going to work with Walter. So the big firms, they're great at big, giant brands that need tons of brand strategy and support and are probably getting professional uh, you know, identity design and all that, they're great for getting the full package. The difference with hiring a boutique firm, like at Eat My Words, you're going to work with me. You will get a team assigned on your project that is actually probably in your target audience or really wants to work on your project because we have so many people that work with us that we assign projects to. So, um, for instance, we're naming a cannabis brand right now, so I put the people at the firm <laughs> that have revealed that they smoke weed, and that's perfect because, you know, what you would not want one of our people that doesn't smoke weed to be naming your product, so we're going to find the right people for it, and it's not just going to get assigned to the next team available. And also, you're, I don't know, I think the smaller firms, obviously, they're going to, you're always going to be a big fish at a small firm, where if you go to a big firm, there's always going to be a bigger client than you. Mm, that's a really great point. I think that is a, a bonus of working with, say, an indie book publisher like Barrett Kohler Publishers. <laughs> For the same reason. Oh, that's so true. No, that's so true. Now, I'll tell you, as one of your authors, that's so true. When I, when I go over there, I... I feel like a big fish, and I know I'm treated like one. And the fact that you t you you take on so few books a year, it it really puts all of your authors at the top of the list. And I'm not just you know one of a couple hundred different authors of books that you're promoting at one time. So now that that's a very good point. Thank you. I was like a little boost for BK. We do work hard. Um, so, uh, you know, the yeah. pseudonyms question that we had earlier was a really good one, and it's actually generating some other questions around it. Um, this next question sort of reminds me of what happens in Hollywood when an actor who doesn't have an easy to pronounce name uh, enters the scene and then their agent says, we're going to change your name to Stone River or something. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, I just made that one up, by the way. <laughs> Um, okay, so interesting comments on pseudonyms. I was thinking about using my real first name with a similar but easier to spell and easier to pronounce last name for my social media presence. What do you think about that? Uh, that's a tough one. I Social media presence, okay, so your Twitter handle and everything. Uh, I don't, I, I would say if you're going to ch change your last name, it's just going to be confused. It will be confusing to the people that already know you, which I imagine are the people you're going to connect with in the very beginning. True. Um, so there's a couple things you can do. I would say, one, don't do that. And two, just 
come up with something about yourself that, you know, like the name whisperer or uh, the big sexy idea guy or what, whatever it is, brand yourself with almost a tagline or a phrase that's you instead of using your name with a different, because it, it will be confusing. It would be like if I changed my name from Alexandra Watkins to Alexandra Watson because it's, e it's easier. Yeah, I would not do that. Or, or just, yeah, give yourself, uh, yeah, create a, a personality or a, a brand tagline for yourself and have that be your name. This is, this is great, actually, because then there's another follow-up question with this, and you kind of touched on this, but um, to close the loop, if using a person's name in business, in a business name, what if the name has more than one common spelling? For example, Sarah with an H versus Sarah without, or Rachel with an A versus Rachel with just an E. I highly recommend that you never use your personal name as your business name. In unless it lends itself to wordplay. Cindy Light is somebody that I work with, and she specializes in two completely different things, fashion consultant and helping people navigate the pitfalls of going to China and not doing, any, not doing anything offensive uh, like in business, right? So almost like etiquette. And... Cindy Light was a great name to play with because Light lends itself to a lot of wordplay. And the name, the tagline, so we said, keep your name Cindy Light. And the tagline we gave her that worked for both, you know, fashion consulting, making you look good, and making you not look like a buffoon in China was Cindy Light making you shine. That's an example of when to use, of how to use your, your personal name if you can tie it into something clever. But for most people, most people's names are hard for people to spell. Even you'd be really surprised. I, Because I ask people about names all the time, their first name. And I was uh, teaching at USF last week. And I asked the class, how many of you, does anyone in here have a name that's a noun? And this guy raised his hand and said, my name is Fox. What a cool name, right, Fox? I said, I bet nobody ever spells your name wrong. And he said, people do. They'll spell it with two X's. So even a name that's that simple, people will misspell. A couple reasons not to use your, your name. One, your name says absolutely nothing about what your brand is, right? If I call my company Alexandra Watkins, it doesn't say anything about words, naming, um, as I said in the beginning, food and beverage. So your name means something to you, to the people that know you, to your family, but it's completely meaningless to any future customers. And if you're just starting a business and you're going to be in business for 20 years or, or more, as the big brands have been, uh, think, you know, look in the crystal ball. Also, you could get married, maybe. And that happened to one of our clients. Uh, her her name was Carrie Sloat. She has Sloat Design. She got married. Her now her name is now Carrie Dufour. There's a complete disconnect between Sloat Design and Carrie Dufour, and she's kept Sloat Design. But you know, people are always like, "Why is it called Sloat Design?" So your name could change. And also something that happened to one of our clients. It's really unfortunate. Sherry Fitzpatrick started Sherry's Berries, a very successful cherry uh, chocolate dipped strawberry company. So Sherry started the company. She was, you know, wildly successful on Oprah and different, uh, you know, Today Show, lots of publications, on the cover of Sky Mall Catalog three times, Sherry's Berries. And this is a great use of, of Sherry. I mean, I probably would have done it too, but what happened is Sherry uh, took on some new people in the company. She eventually got booted out of her own company um, through a series of unfortunate decisions. And now Sherry's Berries has gone through a couple transitions. It's owned by another company now. And her great name, Sherry, is on Sherry's Berries. They make a, an inferior product to what she was making. These, you know, beautiful hand-dipped chocolate-covered strawberries now are machine-made. They cut off the greenery at the top, so they're, they're just not pretty. There's tons of complaints about them online. And that poor girl, Sherry Fitzpatrick, 
forever people still think that that's her product and they're still ordering it so they're associating an inferior product with somebody who's not an inferior person and she cannot get away from it nor can she use the name Sherry's Berries or any form of Sherry in her new company so uh, she actually has a book called Buried B-E-R-R-I-E-D in chocolate a chocolate a book dipped in chocolate uh, that's really fun I gave one uh, to Jeevan at Barrett Kohler and that's what we recommended she use as her new business name Buried in Chocolate since she already had some traction with a book that was called that so stay away from using your name for all of those reasons it's you know and I think just the most important one to think of is it's your name is completely meaningless to future customers and says nothing about your brand yeah you know and you brought up the wedding uh, thing if somebody gets married that is one of those issues it's kind of a modern issue because I don't think people cared about things like personal brand uh, before the internet in the same way. Um, but we see that now, yeah. you know, like celebrities get married and, you know, they have to keep their name because they, they that's what they're known for. Jessica Alba didn't take her husband's name. She's still Jessica Alba. So, you know, there's, there are interesting things about that that we need to think about more consciously um, as the internet and as branding becomes more and more important. So this next question is, how did you come up with the title for your new book, Hello, My Name is Awesome? Were there any other runner, runner-ups? That's such a good question. I was trying to remember that yesterday. It popped into my head. I don't know when, or I remember it, I really struggled in the beginning because it was such tremendous pressure for a namer to come up with a book title. Um, I, I put it out there on Facebook, as I always do with my friends, like, hey, you know, like, what should my new personalized license plate be? And I, I put out the book title thing, what should I name my new book? And, you know, a lot of people did, name, like, the name game. That's the name game and what's in a name, by the way, are the two most overused headlines for any article about naming or namers. It's, it's, it's you know, you got to be a little more creative than that. Um, and it wasn't about the name game, and it wasn't about what's in a name. It was really about awesome names. And I must have just seen one of the Hello My Name Is stickers somewhere and just come up with it. But I do know that I came up with it. I just can't remember that exact flash moment when it happened. And I can, I can tell you that for pretty much any name we've ever come up with that's been my name. I can tell you exactly when it happened and how it happened. But in this case, I, I just don't remember. But I knew when I saw it that that was the name. And Barrett Kohler still insisted on doing a survey monkey and testing it. And uh, luckily it won. I, I would have fought tooth and nail to, to keep that as the name. But um, I'm, I'm not a big believer in testing names, by the way. I think that anytime you ask somebody, what do you think of this name, that's not really what they hear. What they hear is, what don't you like about this name? And it's an invitation to criticize. And imagine if, you know, Richard Branson had asked, had like done a survey monkey on the name Virgin, you know, it, it would have <laughs> never gotten off the ground. And also, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't no, that's myself. a really good example. Um, <laughs> when, well, also co coach, right? So coach, you know, luxury brand, beautiful leather bags. If there was a focus group for coach, you just know somebody in the focus group would have said, Coach, ew, no, that's a sweaty fat guy with a whistle. Or, coach, no, that's the worst place to sit on an airplane. So be careful with testing because you're going to get these negative reactions that any name can overcome if there's not – any name can overcome an association with good branding behind it. That's a really good point. Um, although there are some examples and you actually give this in your book and this ties into our next question a little bit. Um, but there are some examples that you give of names that had they been tested, they might have actually found out that nobody knew what that name meant at all. <laughs> like Cho Chocolate, which I know is a favorite uh, one for you to pick on. <laughs> I know one of my Darth Namer, who is, is, one of our best namers that eat my words, Darth Namer and I had, uh, <laughs> we had lunch on Sunday and he gave me two beautiful pieces of Cho chocolate. So, uh, yeah, that was kind of a, it is probably, I'd say my, my most, uh, 
I think it's the most excruciating name, T-C-H-O. And I know that the founder of Cho Chocolate really regrets naming it that because nobody knows how to pronounce it. Nobody knows what it means. And also, because it's spelled in all capital letters, it has what I call capital punishment. And that's where somebody thinks it's pronounced T-C-H-O. And I've heard people pronounce it that way. So be, be careful with that. So I'm, I'm sorry, I totally, <laughs> what was the question I was being okay. asked? So the question is, how long does a typical naming process take? And so this is where it ties in because you have just said, like, you don't do surveys per se, but can you share a brief overview of the naming process? And you actually do cover this in your book as well. Yeah, the naming process. So, I mean, we have a number of naming processes, but I'd say three weeks is pretty typical for one of our projects. But, you know, sometimes, you know, you can hire me to brainstorm with you on the phone, and I always come up with names that way. I, uh, I you know, we're a, a company in the UK hired me to come up to brainstorm with them on name for a new eyeglass store, and I came up with Made You Look, like right on the phone. And another one was a uh, business in LA where you could make your own flower arrangements. You'd go into the store, they already had all the flowers cut, and then you would just make your own arrangement. And I named that Compose Yourself. So sometimes things just pop into my head, but for a full scale naming project at Eat My Words, we're going to have you fill out a creative brief, and then we're going to, you know, have a kickoff meeting and come up with a bunch of names internally on our own, then we're all going to swap lists with each other and then build off of them. And then we have to do some, you know, some uh, trademark screening and present them to you. So that's usually a, a three week process. Great. So this next question is, um, what name have you had the most fun working on? What made it exiting? And what kinds of names do you enjoy coming up with the most? That's actually three oh, that, questions. That's a great question. Yeah, well, you know, far and above anybody else has spooned me, the frozen yogurt franchise. And that's because they really had fun with the name. That name has legs. So when you go to a spoon me, okay, before a spoon me location even opens, instead of the sign saying coming soon, it says spooning soon. When you before you even walk in the door, when you get to the door and it's, it's you know, a, a glass door and it says uh, spooning hours and in Utah, you know, it has the hours and then it says no spooning on Sunday. So they're really having fun with it. And then it says no shirt, no shoes, no spoon. So just like very clever, right? And then on the inside, they took, so we did a bunch of taglines for them that they've used all over the place. So uh, we did also a lot of merchandise. So um, the phrase, if you love me, spoon me, that's on, that's like painted on their walls. We did t-shirts, shut up and spoon me, bumper stickers, if you're driving this close, you might as well spoon me. So lots of fun there. And then in the restrooms, Oh, okay, the restroom, the ladies' room is called, says Yo Mama on it, like, you know, yo for yogurt. And then on the inside, and the great thing about this, I didn't do this, they created this. Uh, they took famous movie slogans or movie lines, and then they replaced them with the word spoon. So, for instance, uh, instead of you had me at hello, it says you had me at spoon me. And then the other one says, yo, Adrian, let's spoon. And then the customers have gotten involved by coming up with them on their own. So that's been really fun. So those are painted all over the walls of the bathrooms. So just, you know, that's an example of a name with legs. That So those are my favorite type of names. I would say retail businesses where we can get a lot of mileage out of the name, have fun with it, put it on merchandise, and use it throughout the business. Those are, yeah, those are the really fun ones. Well, and I'm, I might only be saying this because it's not very often during a work thing that I can say hand job, but when you did the hand job <laughs> name for the nail salon, I have to say that having lived in the Castro in San Francisco, um, that was one of the things that I would, anytime someone came to town, I was like, you have to see the name of this nail salon. And now flash forward, I'm actually working with the person who came up with the name for that place. It sticks. It just does. And so there is something to be said for those provocative names. One of the things that I wanted to follow up on that you said earlier when you talked about that 
um, women's clothing store that ended up with the name that now I've even forgotten since you said it. What was it? Eve something? Ever, ever, ever Eve. Ever Eve. See, what's funny is that had someone said to the founder of Nasty Gal, I don't like your name, you know, we might not have her, she might not have a best selling book today called Girl Boss because. Uh. She went with a name called Nasty Gal, which doesn't necessarily evoke exciting things <laughs> on face value, but she stuck with that name and she really branded it. And now, you know, she's a best-selling author and clearly she's a, she's a top CEO. So um, there is something to be said for that with that advice. Um, so yeah, you have to, you do have to stick with it. You, you do. So this next question um, I think is so perfect for you because I know we have talked about this before um, and you also touch on this in your book, which by the way, in case anybody on this hasn't um, picked up the book, it's called Hello, My Name is Awesome, How to Create Brand Names That Stick. And um, we will send out a discount code to everybody if you haven't received it already um, that will give you 30% off the book on the Barrett Kohler website. So um, thank you in advance for purchasing it, and you're welcome for the discount. Um, <laughs> so here's this question. I was so happy I came up with a domain name, but forgot about having a broader, more comprehensive business name. Does it make sense to have different names for the business and for whatever domains we have? In my case, I'll likely have more than one domain eventually. Thanks for all of your insights. You should only have one name for your business, and but you can buy different domain names that point to that domain or to the your main domain. But I guess what I would say about domain names, and by the way, you can download the free domain names chapter if you go to eatmywords.com and just click on the book page. You'll just go to the site, our microsite for the book, but and download that chapter. There's a lot to learn about domain names. I would say the that's kind of a hard question to answer because I don't know the exact details of it, but I will tell you this. Do not let domain names ob obsess you to the point of giving up on a good business name because the exact match domain name isn't available. Look at, uh, you know, Tesla. Tesla doesn't own Tesla.com. If you go to Tesla.com, you'll see that this domain is owned by GandhiNet and it's a parked page. Tesla is Tesla Motors. And, you know, if you were trying to buy a Tesla and you went to Tesla.com and you saw the page was parked, you wouldn't just give up. You'd just go to Google and type in Tesla cars or something and you'd instantly find the website and be there and you wouldn't even care what the domain name is. And, you know, nobody ever said, I'm not going to do business with this company because they don't own the domain name or I don't trust this company. They don't own the exact domain name. And, you know, when you go to, if you were trying to buy a, you know, find Delta faucets and you typed in delta.com and you got to uh, Delta Airlines, you know, it's not like you're going to buy a plane ticket. You're just going to go to Google and type in Delta faucets or you, you'll find it. That's what people do. So your domain name does not have to be exact. I'll give you an example, though, of what I mean about redirecting to your main site. There's a company called Peanut Butter and Co., and they own that web domain, peanutbutterandandco.com. But they have another domain that's way better, which is ilovepeanutbutter.com. And that's super easy to remember. And that's what I mean about multiple domain names and phrases working really well. I Love Peanut Butter isn't the name of their company, but if you go to Peanut Butter & Co., it actually redirects to I Love Peanut Butter. And that, if you love peanut butter like I do, you will never forget that domain name. It just it makes you break out in a smile. And they were so smart to get that. So. Uh, we named a popcorn store one time, Pop Psychology, and psychology is really hard to spell. In fact, I even bought the wrong domain name because it is so hard to spell. So uh, we suggested the domain name Crazy for Popcorn, which was also the tagline. So you can try phrases for your domain name or just add a modifier like Tesla did with Motors, but um, don't make domain names Domain names are really not that important, and, and I am honestly telling you the truth when I say this. On many, many occasions, I've completely forgot to have our team even look up the domain names because our clients know that it's not that important, and 
it, it really doesn't matter. Everybody knows at this point, you know, there's over 252 million .com domain names that have been purchased. There's not a lot left. And uh, once in a while we do find them, and we found one the other day for this Canadian motorcycle company, and I can't tell you what it is, but I was shocked that this name had not been taken. So they do still exist, but that's about, you know, coming up with something completely unexpected. Okay, so this next question um, is great because uh, it, it's about luxury brand names. So the question is, any tips specific to luxury brand names? It seems like most designers use their own name or something random like Barney's, which is true. You know, you think of all the big designers out there. There's Versace and, like you mentioned earlier, Gucci, Dolce & Gabbana. It, it seems like designers really just want to put their name on things. Yeah, they do, but they're, nobody is ever famous overnight with a name. They're just not. I mean, look at those look at those names that you love, Versace and Dolce and Gabbana. Those no, if you you you're starting a business, you need to be successful right away. Those type of names are going to take a really long time to gain traction, and that's why I just don't recommend them. Fashion, like you know. That European fashion always gets a pass, right? Those names, and a name like Versace, obviously, you know, started in Italy, got very popular, but took years to be on the radar of us here. So I'm, I'm not a big fashion, you know, like I said, with Juicy Couture, it says something about the name. Hollister, you know, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Hollister, but it's, it's not a particularly cool place, but they made that name work. But that's the result of tons and tons of money spent on advertising and branding and most people starting out don't have that type of budget to get their name out there. We just named a luxury brand and we came up with a name, I can't tell you what it is yet, but we came up with a name that is evocative of luxury, but it's not a, a person's name, it's a real word that if I said it to you, you would instantly picture luxury in your head. And that's what I would just suggest going for with a luxury brand. If you want to get traction quickly and have your name communicate something about your brand, have it be a word that people recognize and not something that's mysterious and is going to take a very long time to get noticed or get known, I should say. Well, isn't there also something to... Um... Also making sure that your name isn't too generic as well. I, I was thinking of some examples where it really works. For example, we went to New York recently and there was a place in Harlem called Earl's Beer and Cheese. And I loved it because you walked in and you knew exactly what you were getting. You were going to get beer and you were going to get food with cheese. In it. And, it was, and those are two very delicious things so <laughs> um, that go great together. But then I also think of examples like, there's Bath and Body Works and there's the Body Shop. And how often have you said the wrong name when you really meant something else? Um, because their names are so similar and they do very similar things but have a different concept within the store. Um, so isn't there something to making sure that a name isn't, is, is evocative without being too generic as well? Well, I would say you. the thing I would be careful of is that you don't, outgrow your names, like Earl's Beer and Cheese, if they ever wanted to sell something other than that. I mean, obviously their core offering will always be Beer and Cheese, but sometimes your name, a name that's that descriptive can be too limiting. I don't get Bath and Body Works and the Body Shop mixed up at all. I think their brands are so completely different. Um, the Body Shop to me is, is more exclusive and sexy. And I love that name, and that's another one that would have gotten killed in a focus group when somebody said, body shop? Gross. That's where a bunch of greasy guys are working on your car. That's gross, <laughs> right? That doesn't remind me of beauty, but that name is fun. And thank goodness that they didn't test it, and they just went with it, and they owned it. With um, Bath and Body Works, to me, that's more of like, it's also, yes, in every mall, but it's it's a little more middle America, um, I think with your name, you want it to be not so generic that you can't trademark it or not so descriptive that you can't trademark it, but it's got to be evocative of something about your brand. Right, right. Well, and I also thought of um, the third one, which is the other big chain now for 
for body works type stuff is uh, Lush, which to me seems like the best name of the three. Um, yes, and Lush is, uh, you know, the, also, like, I first saw Lush uh, in, uh, I don't know where I was, like in Denmark or somewhere. I I've, I've saw it all over Europe before I ever saw it here. That I saw it from across the street, and I'm like, what is that? And I, I literally, the name attracted me, and I walked into the store, and I loved it. And that's another name, Lush, and I listed it in the book along with the body shop and virgin that would have been killed in a focus group. Lush, no, that's a drunk person. So, yeah, that's a great name. And, like, Bed Bath & Beyond, I really like that name because it beyond includes everything. But I'll tell you, we, I, my office is, is two blocks from a Bed Bath & Beyond. And a couple of years ago, they, they added a whole bunch of new things in there, a lot more, more like drugstore type products. And... I guarantee you that people don't even know that that's there now. So uh, maybe Bed Bath and Beyond isn't, well, I guess that falls under Beyond. But yeah, sometimes you just want to make sure that your name will scale to fit. Um, yeah, but Bed Bath and Drugs just <laughs> Bed Bath and Drugs doesn't really work as well. That's, that's, uh, that's too much knowing too much about what's going on in someone's medicine cabinet, I think. But <laughs> um, okay, yeah. so yeah, touching back on the luxury question because I do think this is a good one. She she asked um, she added to it. The luxury question is actually for a retailer, not a merchandise brand. Does your advice change at all when we're talking about a retailer versus a, uh, a merchandise brand? Yeah, yeah. I, I guess a retailer is a little different because it's a store. People are going to be walking by it. There's window displays. So, yeah, I mean, I, I guess that that's not as important then. But, yeah, and if it's in a mall, you know, we've seen those stores. So, yeah, you know, Michael Kors, right, at Westfield Center. But we all know Michael Kors from Project Runway. Sure. So, um, yeah, but with big windows, sure, you can get away with a lot. Sure. So uh, this next question, this is, I love, of course, personally, I'm loving this conversation because you know how much I love fashion and, um, and I would love to just be in luxury brands, whatever they are all the time, just like anybody. But, um, <laughs> so this next question is, what do you think of the name of Kelly Osborne's new fashion line stories? That's interesting. I haven't heard of that, but I like it. If it's spelled S T O R I E S. It yeah, is. what I like about it, it's evocative, and you can assign your own meaning to it. But yeah, I I like it. It's just different, and it's you know, you know, Kelly Osborne. She's you know, I think she's she's I don't know. She's smart not to use her own name because she's polarizing. Some people don't like her. And if you're in the store and you don't know it's her line and you see stories and like, oh, it's that. So I think that's good. Um, a, a really bad name that a celebrity person used is uh, Serena Williams has a clothing line. And it's Serena spelled backwards, which is like A-R-E-N-A. I don't know. It's is impossible it to pronounce. Yeah, I, no R one knows how to pronounce it. Yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> so that, that, that's an example of somebody trying to be clever. And just because something's creative, like you could wear two mismatched socks. And yes, that's creative, but does it make it good? No. And so with your name, I mean, the one thing we haven't touched on really at all is you do want to make sure that people – you know, that your name is easy to pronounce, it's easy to spell, that it says that people, you know, again, it's evocative of something about your brand, Arnest or whatever, it's, it's too inside. The one name spelled backwards that works really well is Oprah's production company, Harpo. Um, it, you know how to pronounce it, you know how to spell it. it, it's evocative of Harpo Marx, and I always say uh, Harpo makes, makes people smile in either direction it's written in, whether it's Oprah or Harpo. Uh, that's a good one. And of course, obviously, nobody has a bigger empire at this point than Oprah, probably. So. Right, right. Um, so I'm going to combine two questions here. Um, this is following up on, a dis on the discussion earlier about the difference between um, uh, a brand and a retailer. But this is actually a question of 
digital versus um, digital versus storefront or brick and mortar. Does it make a difference whether the the seller is online or if they have a brick and mortar um, in this day and age? Does it seems like everybody has a URL? Yeah, you gotta have, you gotta have both. If you're gonna be a retailer, you have to be selling online too. Um, and that's where, you know, if people aren't in your city and they're not walking by your store, and I imagine you're just going to have one in the beginning, um, people do want to find you online. So while, yes, the people walking by can look in the window and see all the great stuff you're offering, on, online you need your name to work harder because you're not going to have that window to display. And what about if you're carrying other brands like Bloomingdale's, for example, would be an example of a place or Macy's or someone who, who carries other brands items. They don't stock their own brands. Does it make a difference? I, no, I don't think so. And, you know, let's let's just be honest here. Bloomingdale's, I mean, when they, when they came to San Francisco and I'm not a New Yorker or familiar with New York, um, even though I've been to 45 countries, <laughs> somehow I just haven't spent a lot of time there. And, like, I didn't know the Bloomingdale's brand. I thought it sounded super old and dated, like bloomers. I had no idea that they were a luxury retailer. Macy's, you know, named after a person, and I'm sure Bloomingdale's was too, a really long time ago. Don't look at old brands as guide guidepost of what to do we're in a whole new world now you know we're, we're in the digital age like you said things have to work harder I think this is a point well taken and probably the central point of this hour's conversation so we just have a few more minutes um, I'm going to ask one more question I think this is a really great place to end actually um, this person has a couple of name ideas and can find pros and cons to all of them but at what point should you just pick a name and go with it when you have a name that passes the smile and scratch test, which is the 12 points that you want to evaluate your name with, smile is an acronym for what makes a name great. Is it suggestive of something about your brand? Is it meaningful to your customers, not just to you? Does it have imagery so when people hear it, they can picture something in their head? Does it have legs like Spoon Me where you can extend the brand through wordplay? And the E in Smile is emotional connection. You know, does it resonate with people and, and cause them to either smile or, you know, have a great, just have a great connection with your brand? And then scratch, when to scratch it off the list, and this is what I'm saying, like if, if you don't just settle on a name if it has any of these deal breakers. If your name is spelling challenge, if your name looks like a typo, it's a mistake. If you say it into your iPhone and Siri doesn't know how to spell what you're saying, that's bad. If Word, if, uh, you know, uh, spell check or, you know, Microsoft Word flags your name as being misspelled, um, that's going to be troublesome for people. So be really careful with spelling. It should be spelled exactly how it sounds. If it's um, if it's a copycat name, like don't name your name your company anything like I Car E Insurance. <laughs> and then let's see, A annoying, like the backwards spelling. Let's see, <laughs> the T in Scratch is for tame. You don't want your name to be boring. It's got to stand out. Um, the second C is for curse of knowledge. You don't want your name to be have some meaning in a foreign language that nobody understands or a meaning to engineers that might work for them, but your customer doesn't know what it means. Um, and then you don't want your name to be hard to pronounce. That's just, you know, it's, it's like going to a restaurant and not being able to pronounce something on the menu so you don't order it because you don't want to embarrass yourself. So, yeah. Make sure it passes the smile and scratch test. The, the book has a lot of information on it, and it's also on eatmywords.com. If you just scroll down the homepage to Does Your Name Suck, you can see, you can just keep <laughs> taking that test until your name passes. And there's there's also, Barrett Kohler has a great 30 point self assessment test on their website um, that's like the smile and scratch test on steroids, and that I also recommend doing. 
So I, we are out of time at this point. I want to thank you so much again, Alexander, for spending an hour with us today in this Ask Me Anything session. I think everybody learned a lot. I know I did. So thank you. Well, thank you. Those are great questions, and you guys kept me on my toes. So <laughs> I'm glad, I'm glad I, I'm glad I could help. And there's like a ton of additional information in the book, and I hope that you all get it. Yeah, and I want to let everybody know that speaking of the book, um, I did just actually post the discount link in the chat box. We'll also email this to you. But in the chat box now, you should see a link. It should be a bit.ly link for awesome book discount. You can use that to get 30% off on Alexander's book right now on the Barrett Kohler website. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And Alexander, thank you again for joining us. Um, we hope that everybody loves the book and um, and that you take advantage of the discount. And I will let everybody know that a recording will be made available of today's event um, sometime over the next couple of weeks. And we'll email that to you as well. Thank so, you. Thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon, everybody. And uh, I look forward to reading your names. Take care. <laughs> <laughs>